Now it's time to talk about magnetic fields. I like this picture of Tesla. He's feeling underappreciated again. So we have uh, magnetic fields and we're going to define the lines that we're going to draw because we're going to learn how to draw magnetic field lines and then we're going to quantify them with some equations. But we define it as the north on a compass, like where it would point. You know what a little compass is? It's usually a little thing that sort of spins around and depends on the magnetic field and it points somewhere. So if you imagine you had a little compass, uh, don't you sort of see them don't they look like this like a if nothing else if you're using even like google maps or something like that even with that they usually draw like this right here you know and this right here is sort of shaded red you know isn't that sort of a little compass like that it's supposed to point north uh in a real life you know you might actually have a uh, an actual compass that you carry around i know when i've been in the woods for example we carry around a little compass like this it's a little thing that's allowed to spin then it can rotate it tells you which way is north then you can use that to navigate so if we have a magnet, so let's just say we have a magnet here, uh, we define things as north and south. So conversely, you know with charges, we had a positive and a negative charge. And what's interesting is charges can exist on their own. In other words, you can have a positive charge uh, by itself, or you can have a negative charge by itself. But for some reason, you can't have uh, a north by itself. So there exists a statement that says that there's no magnetic monopoles. It's really interesting. If you have like a compass like north-south and you go and start cutting it, it's still going to be north-south, still north-south. And then to the atom, the moment you cut it, boom, it becomes north-south, north-south. You can't have a north by itself. It's really weird. So imagine you have a bar magnet like this right here. Imagine that I place my little compass right here. Maybe I place it right here. Where would it point? Do you know that a north and a north, they don't like each other. They're going to repel. So it's going to go away from the north. But if I placed a compass right here towards the south, you can see that it would actually be attracted to the south. So then I could draw my magnetic field lines. I don't know if you see this, but you can actually go like this. You can draw them going out like that. And then out like this right here. Like that. And of course you can draw more lines. And more lines. You can draw as many as you feel like. Right? Go along forever. So it looks kind of like an apple core, I guess, or whatever you want to draw. So it looks like this. This is how the magnetic field lines uh, work. Now, have you ever seen people say that Earth is kind of like this? They can say, yeah, the Earth can be sort of looked at as a bar magnet. So you could say that it's like the Earth has a, uh, this is a very careful thing, watch this carefully. It's technically a south here and a north here. And this is the part that's really weird to people. They say, no, we call it the North Pole. Yeah, 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 we do. It's technically then a magnetic south. Because don't we agree that a north on a compass would never point towards a north, a north you know, is away from a north. So watch carefully. This is actually the Earth. If we draw the Earth like this, it's just a minor little thing, but um, technically, you know, the lines should go like this. This is actually how it looks on Earth. We still call this the North Pole because it is the direction that north would point, but it's technically a magnetic south. Some people get really bothered by that, so don't worry too much. If that really makes you upset, don't worry. You can say fine. It's still a north. Oh, wait a second. I drew one of my arrows wrong, didn't I? Look at this. This isn't this way. That one should be that way. I just want to make sure my drawing looks okay, right? I don't want to give you the wrong information. There we go. So this is how it's drawn. Now we're going to quantify things. So we're going to have a moving charge in a magnetic field. So imagine I have a magnetic field, I have a charge, and I move it along within it. We have an equation that's from your data booklet, and it goes like this. It goes F equals Q V B sine theta. This is the equation you need. I don't know why I'm making sound effects, but there you go. So this is a vector, so is this. So let's maybe define a few things here. It's important to define them. So what's a force? In this case, it'll be a magnetic force, you could say. It's gonna be the force that's acting on a charge. So force is measured in Newtons. Do you remember what the unit of charge is? Q is a charge, so that's in Coulombs. V is the speed of this particle, or this charge, so in this case, speed is in meters per second. Interestingly, here we have the unit of magnetic field strength. I just want to draw it nicely here, draw a better S. So magnetic field strength, this is a new unit. Okay, this is something that we haven't talked about at least yet. We measure in a unit called Tesla, that's why I put Tesla here. He's underappreciated in a lot of science. Well, there's a resurgence uh, for him. But anyway, magnetic field strength measured in Teslas. That's why it's named after him. Also, the car company, no big surprise, is named there. Then we have the angle between B and V. So the angle between the velocity, or you could say the speed, in this case right here. Uh, and the angle could be in degrees. So this is it. 
This is just the angle between them. What happens if the angle is 90 degrees? Then sine of 90 um, is actually 1. So then away you go. You can figure that out. Uh, that comes from, look at this graph here. Graph of sine of x, it goes like this, doesn't it? And this right here is 360 degrees. This is 180 degrees. So this right here is 90 degrees. And the sine of 90, in other words, if they're perpendicular, sine of 90 is the, this is x equals 90, this is the y value, and that's 1. So sine of 90 degrees equals 1. Just so you know, this is sometimes a nice to know. Just remember that one. Actually, I'll write it like this. I'll say if, if uh, theta equals 90 degrees, we know that sine of 90 equals 1. This is maybe a good sort of trick for you. So nice little thing to try to remember. That's it. That's not so bad, is it? Uh, then we have another equation. What if we have a wire in a magnetic field? So this is another equation you get. And this one looks a little bit like the other one, except instead of going QVB sine theta, this one goes BIL sine theta. So we'll define these things. So what are these? Maybe I better put the vector symbol on that. So F is a force. It's a magnetic force still. So that's still measured in. Let's think. What kind of units do we have for force again? Newtons. Magnetic field strength, we know that now. It's Teslas. Current in the wire. What's that? It's measured in amperes. L, length of a wire. What do you think length is measured in? Meters. And finally, theta is the angle between B and I. So that would be measured in degrees. And again, remember that if sine... Uh, and that if they're perpendicular, that sine of 90 degrees is 1. So that way they sort of work out. That's not so bad, is it? Uh, what I think is uh, really neat then, you can start solving some questions. This is like what the IB loves to have questions about ratios. You know, things where, you know, you have something that changes by a certain factor. And the sooner you get used to those and see them as something to smile about, the better off you'll be. Because they show up a lot in paper 1 especially. Um, I know that, for example, if you do astrophysics option, they, these kind of ratio things show up all the time there. Not all the time, but lots. So let's see. We have a wire that has a current I running through it, which is in a magnetic field B that is perpendicular to the current. What does the word, let's just break it down here. What does the word perpendicular mean? I hope you know that theta equals 90. That's going to be the key here. So it feels a force F. So right away, before starting anything else, I usually then just like to write an equation for F. So F equals, now we have a wire with current running through it. So can you see we would use this equation for a wire, which is BIL sine theta. One of my students was like, oh yeah, that's Bill. And this one he just called it QVB. That doesn't really work very nicely, but that's Bill. So we have F equals Bill sine theta, of course. Put the vector symbols. Um, but we know that theta is 90. And remember, we learned that if theta is 90 degrees, what do we get? We have sine 90 equals 1. Therefore, we could state that F equals, it's nice and easy, it's just bill without any sine theta. That's kind of nice. So F equals bill. Uh, maybe I'll just take away the vectors just to keep it nice and easy. So F equals BIL. This is what we're going to use. Now we have a new force. What do I mean by new force? I'm going to write it maybe with different letters here. New force, maybe we'll call it F2, just like it's another force. So I'll write it down. So F2. That also goes bill, except the current is I over 8. So instead of I, I'm going to say I over 8. has the same length, I guess. So I'll put an L. And instead of B, what do I put in? Let's say magnetic field strength is 16B. So watch, I just put in 16B. That's not so hard, is it? You see that on that F2, I could just re, uh, simplify this at least. What's 16 divided by 8? I hope you see it's 2B. I, L. Here's a trick now. If you want a new force, a good way to do it is to do this. Do a ratio. This is the key here. You can use this sort of tool a lot in IB physics, SL or HL. This is very, very common. This is really, really common. And the good news, they're really easy. What I like to do is just say, fine. Um, I don't say fine, but what I say is, I'll do F2 divided by F1. And you can literally divide in a whole equation. So I can say F2, which is equal to 2BIL, divided by F1, and F1 equals BIL. The reason I do this is I want F2 as a function of F1. Oops, and I actually don't need to call it F1. I can just call it F. That's what we named it. So can you see that 
it's really, really obvious on what cancels out. These BILs right here, they cancel out. So can you see I end up with F2 over F equals 2? Therefore, can you get F2 by itself then? And you move the F up to the top here. So you have F2 is 2F. So what does that mean? That means that making the magnetic field change by 16 times stronger, but at the same time making the current eight times weaker will end up still giving you twice the magnetic force. So this is sort of how you can use this. And uh, this kind of stuff is very, very useful. I mean, in everyday life, you've got particles flying around. So if the particle is uh, entering a magnetic field, then that particle will curve because it'll feel force. So it'll actually deviate because of it. And that's used to explain things like uh, mass spectrometers, because then you have unknown particles, like you don't know what kind they are. But it turns out if you know their velocity, which you call the velocity selector, you pass into a magnetic field, they're going to curve. And the radius of the curvature is going to be dependent on the mass. That's why like in CSI and these kind of shows like that when they play cool music, whatever, what they're really doing, they're putting it into a machine, this material they don't know, and it tells them the mass. That's why it's called a mass spectrometer because you're breaking up the mass in almost like a spectrum of masses. And just like uh, with QVB sine theta, I like this Bill sine theta. For example, um, people who fly uh, anti-submarine missions, uh, so people who are you know in the military, they're looking for submarines, Turns out if you have, for example, at the back of one of these planes, they have something called a MAD boom. It's called a magnetic anomaly detector. At the back of the plane, it's got this big thing. What it's doing is it's measuring uh, force and current and length. Because it turns out if you know the length and you know the current you're running through it, you can measure the force or you can do the opposite. Right? But it turns out as you pass over then a disturbance in the Earth's magnetic field, like, oh, I don't know, a big ass piece of metal in the water, Turns out that's going to cause a disturbance in the Earth's magnetic field. So which means if you are actually flying in your airplane, let's just say, this is actually really cool here. So you're flying in your airplane, here's the water here, and here's your airplane. I'm really a bad artist, as you can see, but your airplane has this big, big thing called a mad boom here, this big thing sticking out of the back of it. This thing is going to detect, then, a disturbance in the Earth's magnetic field, and that's how they can know that there is a submarine that's actually hanging up under the water here. So that's how they can say, aha! So I know that, uh, you know, then they can say, you know, okay, have a mad contact, then you know to turn around and start looking for them. So there's a lot of practical uh, aspects, both good and for bad. Uh, I guess humans do terrible things as well to each other, like submarines, which have nuclear weapons in them. So we have to have airplanes that can find those submarines in case, I don't know, someone goes crazy and wants to launch all these things. So there's some sort of scary things there, but the science is just science, right? You can use it for good or for bad. Like I said, so for good, you know, like a mass spectrometer, or maybe for bad things like, I don't know, finding submarines.